All right, it looks like we are live and recording, it says. Um, so if you guys can see and hear us, please let us know. Uh, my name is Ada. I am here with the amazing, super talented, super smart, wonderful Linda Joy, um, product designer extraordinaire. And I know all of this to be facts because um, Linda, fortunately for me, is a close friend of mine. Um, and I'm really excited to have her here. So um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ada Bernier. I'm the founder and CEO of Skill Crush. We are an online tech education company. Um, our job is to get you a job is what we say. And we train our students in front-end development and design, um, although we're going to talk about the complicated nature of defining what design is. Um, and um, the you know purpose of this webinar is to give you guys some insight into what a product designer does. Um, we have gotten a bunch of questions ahead of time from you all. Um, which have informed the presentation that Linda is going to give. But in addition to that, you're welcome to ask questions. Um, I will do my best to keep up with the chat, but that can be hard during a live webinar. So if you have a question we, you really want to make sure Linda answers, please put it in the ask a question module at the bottom of the screen. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here. Um, and I think we can just go ahead and get started. So if I can just get a confirmation from someone that you all can hear and see us, then um, we can get going because I don't want anyone to miss a word of what Linda has to say. Um, looks I like we have people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. We got confirmation. Cool. So um, this is my very good friend, Linda Joy. Um, I am here in Queens. She sadly has de de defected Queens for Florida for the beautiful, what is it called? It's called the something coast. The space coast. The space coast of Florida. Yes. Um, yes. And um, she is a product designer at a company called Teachers Pay Teachers, which is a really, really cool company that I, um, I forget if I first found out about it through you or through David, my husband, who was a high school teacher at the time. But either way, um, it was fun to know somebody on the inside and also know somebody who was an end user of the company um, and the organization. And um, anyway, so Linda has a really beautiful story that she's going to share with us of a non-traditional path into working in design. This is definitely not what she majored in in college. And I'll let her tell that story. And um, and otherwise, that's it. I will just get out of the way and and have you have you take over. Um, so yeah, All right. take it away, Thanks, Linda. Bye. Cool. All right, here I go. So I have prepared a few slides for you. I'm going to share my screen and hope that I do this right. Okay, I want to start playing it first and then see if I can share it. Oh, it works. Okay, I'm just going to have to select the window, feel crash, share, and hopefully this works. Oh no, now I can't see. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I wait, think I, I need to focus play? that screen. Okay, okay, now we go. Yes, I, I see Perfect. it. I think everyone Excellent. else should see it. All right. Well, a little bit about me. Uh, I've always identified with this quote from E.B. White. I get up every morning determined to both change the world and have one hell of a good time. Sometimes that makes planning my day difficult. <laughs> Uh, I definitely still feel this. I still haven't quite figured out how to plan my day around it, but that's uh, it's, it's definitely where where we're starting from. And this this next slide is just a little little intro teaser. This is like something that's from my portfolio, um, which I just realized I haven't actually done a portfolio interview in about five years, which is wild. I've been at TPT quite some time now. Um, I think that the most important thing I would take away from this slide is that maker is only just one part of what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll talk a little bit more about my, my whole history as a designer and my career um, on the next slide, but uh, it's really like, it's it's just a fraction of it. Like there's so much more to it. There's the, and I love all of this part, like the researching, understanding, um, actually getting to make some things, but then also like facilitating decision-making, prioritizing what we should do first. and coaches on there as well as like over my career, I've become more and more of a leader and now I'm actually a manager. So this is my career timeline. Um, 
I, I would say I got in, into design because I was excited about creative problem solving. Literally just a kid walking around a library down the road from where I am now, looking at books, trying to figure out what I was going to be. There's a book called Creative Problem Solving. And it could have probably been about anything, but it just happened to actually be a book about graphic design. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, for me, I was just excited that I was like, okay, I want to be creative. I love, I love art. Um, but I also really have this analytical side and I want to be like scientific about things. And I want to um, really get into difficult problems. And ultimately I did, I went and got a degree in graphic design. Um, and that was, a long time ago at this point, it feels. But the what my degree was really all entirely in print. So I only really learned all the, the craft, typography, page layout, like cutting things out of paper, all kinds of things that I do not use today. Uh, and my first work was really in it was, it was a tiny studio, all print. And the problem I was trying to solve was mostly just like, how do I make this look cool? Like music and film stuff. It was, it was one job. In a lot of ways, I was definitely like having a good time. Part of the EB White quote. And uh, uh, after I left there, I moved to New York, and I was a, a freelancer. And I was like, okay, well, like I can't do just print stuff. This internet thing is going to be really important. And so a big part of what I was problem I was solving was like, how do you make a website? And I spent time teaching myself a little bit of front end coding. I would it took my print and brand design skills, and then said like, oh, I can make you a logo, but then I can also make you a website, even though I really had no idea how to do that other than get a WordPress template and like hack it. Um, Which is a totally legitimate that. way to do it, by the way, still today. <laughs> agree, agree. Yes, I learned so much from hacking other people's code. Um, and let's see, so that was really just, I spent a long time just like figuring out how to make that work. And by the end of it, I was like, okay, I think that I kind of know how to make a website. And this is how I stumbled across this I, this field of user experience by just like, you know, Googling, like, I don't know, what does what a good landing page look like? Or yeah, and like, probably like, similar to how many of the people who are in this audience stumbled or like discovered the field of user experience design. Yeah, totally. I had never yeah. heard of it. I'd never yeah. heard of it. I actually had been thinking like, should I get a coding degree? Because going to a coding boot camp was becoming more and more of a thing back then. Um, and then I was like, yeah, I don't think I really want to code all day personally. And so I was like, okay, UX, this sounds like way more like what I was trying to do in the first place with design. So I went to What was your assembly. understanding, do you think, of UX before you? Yeah, like when you say that, like what did you think you were getting yourself into? I mean, I really was just like blown away when I was just reading like what the UX program was. Because I was like, oh, okay, so wait, instead of just designing stuff for a client, I'm going to go and like talk to users, like talk to the people who actually want to buy or participate with the project. Um, and then I'm going to try things, prototype them, test them. And this like made so much sense after someone as being someone who had been just like making things and putting them out in the world, which is generally how visual design works. And you're just like, yeah, we have arguments over like what's the right color blue and like what's the right like, does this look cool or not? Or does this look expensive enough? Uh, and this was like, okay, wait, I get to like take my clients out of this. So I was just really excited about that aspect of it. And just the like, you know, it's it's not science. It's not like a hard science, but it's a, it's a more scientific approach. So that's- Yeah, I, I, I think I it's funny because I feel like, and it, this actually though applies in a lot of contexts for web like any kind of web stuff, right? Is like, I love that about the web that you can continue to iterate. Yes, yeah, being able to change it afterwards. It's not just like it's printed, it's over, type yeah. was there forever. You never get to redo it. <laughs> type was <laughs> in there forever. So yeah, this is a real problem for you guys. But yes, okay, all right, continue. Yeah, so then I did the GA course, the full-time immersive, and this was this like, uh, the first time that I was really taking time to, for every design project, thinking like, what are the user needs? What are the business goals? How, how do we make these come together? Um, and, and like, how do we make a user experience that supports both of these things? And it was actually, you know, it was a great experience. Like I, I highly recommend uh, uh, getting, like I, I'm not here to sell you Skillcrunch, but yeah, I definitely recommend getting like a, a solid education, um, like a foundation somewhere. I'm not the kind of person who could learn this like totally on my own or just reading books. 
so much of it is like getting feedback from your peers, your coach, your mentor, um, stuff like that. I actually work with someone that I did my UX program with now. That's funny. Yeah. Um, we still harken back to those days. <laughs> Um, yeah, and one of the best things about GA was that they got us to our last project was always to like work with an outside client, which is very different than when you're just working internally because you can, you know, making trade offs of like a project that you made up on your own is really easy and you do things very idealistically. And then once you probably have someone who's like, actually, we have we have other thoughts about that, you have to get into the other skills of, of design, which is like actually that facilitation and negotiation of well, what are we really trying to do here? What's most important which we prioritize? Mm -hmm. So I, um, I very was very lucky to get a job at Pivotal Labs coming out of this program. I was actually, fun fact, I got this job through my bartending gig. I bartended every Thursday night and just like a little extra cash. And one of my very regulars, it turned out was a software engineer. I was like, wow, you stay up really late on work week night. But um, <laughs> you have a job? Okay, great. He's like, it's flexible. <laughs> he was an extremely talented engineer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he got me connected to Pivotal. And um, this was a. I really feel like there's awesome... a little more to the story. How did he even know that you were interested in UX design? Well, because I was working on my prototype for some, some project. And of course you want to test it with potential users um, or really just anyone just to get some usability feedback yeah. and people who are a little bit tipsy are like a great, great source because they're very honest. That's um, a good, and, that's know, a good tip. Kind of a I, used to do, I used to do it at <laughs> coffee shops, but I'm like, oh, at a bar, even better. Yeah. Yeah. At a bar, people are like, kind of, it's like when you're, you know, when you're using your phone, you're just like, oh, yeah, wait, what is that? What did I just sign up for? Or <laughs> yeah, that's when people make the most mistakes anyway. <laughs> so that's I awesome. can use it when they had, a, after they've had a drink or two, and it's a really useful website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he just was like, oh, yeah, we need UX designers. <laughs> <laughs> So somehow that worked out. Um, Pivotal is a cool company to work for because they, uh, they're they really focused on, uh, they're, they're an agency, like, but they work really collaboratively with their clients. They even bring their clients on site. And you're almost always trying to work with them to build a minimum, minimum viable product. So they're usually people who are not just trying to build something, these clients, but also trying to kind of coach their team into working in a, in like a new way and Pivotal was really kind of selling their process, which was extremely hard for me because I really was not prepared. I really was not quite qualified for this position. So I was often like kind of studying the night before. I'm like, how am I gonna do this thing? <laughs> Cause I need to go act like I know what I'm doing in front of a client. But I mean, uh, through through doing that, I, I did get to, I did really learn a lot. And I learned from a lot of really smart people at Pivotal, they were very, um, very generous with their time and education. So yeah, it was very process driven, which was great. Um, and let's see, what else at Pivotal? I remember you talking about pairing at Pivotal well and how that like was oh, really, yeah. I don't know. I don't like, I'm trying to remember what the exact conversation was, but you were sort of saying that it was like this really intense kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah, like so Pivotal is unique. Most companies don't do this in that they really push pair programming where engineers are sitting side by side, sharing one computer with two monitors and going back and forth as they code with the idea that this is making like higher quality code. And it's very, it's like do something called test driven development where you basically write a test first to say like, does this thing work? And then you actually write the code to make the thing work. So the test should then pass once your code is written. Design is a little bit different, um, but they still have the, the ethos of this like really tight collaboration. And it was the same kind of um, concept where you're just by working more closely with the designer as you go, you're, you're having to think out loud about what decisions you're making, what you're thinking. Um, and there's someone next to you to kind of like help synthesize and sometimes poke holes or encourage, which I really miss, to be honest. I mean, especially when everything went remote, it's like, you know, you get the, there's definitely the problem if you spend too much time on a design problem, then uh, 
sometimes you've just like spun off somewhere that like you you like missed some logical thing like a few steps back and it also was just a great way to to learn really quickly when we have new designers start i always try to pair with them as much as i can on their first projects so that we can yeah, have that knowledge transfer i can really see like okay this is where i'm going to do this here's where this thing's located this is why i'm pulling this component in here stuff like that um but Pivotal was like in being an agency, it was, uh, I never knew what I was going to work on. And sometimes it was something really fun. Uh, I got to work on like a video game once called Tampon Run. And then <laughs> after that, I was like, okay, now I'm doing mortgage insurance. And she was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I feel like they're really great. Agencies are amazing for jobs. And actually, I will say agencies actually, in our sort of anecdotal, anecdotal experience, tend to be more likely to hire entry level people. Um, and I think it can be a really good first job because you get exposure to so many things. But I do think that not everybody, but a lot of people end up sort of tiring of that switching experience all the time. Yeah. And I definitely had this conversation with folks at the time, like people like to go back and forth, you know, between like being in house somewhere and then being in an agency. Um, when you're thinking about like a longer term career, I definitely have that feeling now sometimes where I'm like, okay, yeah, like it would be, maybe it'd be nice to change it up every Right, every now and again. Month. Yeah. Yeah. But I totally agree on like it being a, a, a great training ground so that you're exposed to a lot more different kinds of design problems or different in different kinds of companies, just like for thinking about what you might want to actually do when you want to go deep on something or if you do want to go in house. So tell us about your next job after that. Yeah. How long so, are you? I was like, all right. I don't want to be accidentally like, or I don't want to be stuck on mortgage insurance anymore or like big banks. I was like, I want to work for a product company. I want to really get to put all this stuff into practice over a longer period of time. I want it to be mission driven, you know, change the world. And uh, that's when I worked at this place called Quartet Health, which was a startup. And it was like a startup that had just gotten a whole bunch of funding. Uh, and it was just a wild ride. Like they had funding from Google, but it was also like, I had no idea what I was getting into. It was like pretty chaotic because they had a product, they had an idea, they had like one client, but they did not have what we call product market fit, which meant like they were not having a, did not hit their stride on being able to like really sell what they were offering out to a lot of folks and it like being a, a profitable business. Um, but it was a, it was also a great learning experience. I was there for just over a year. Um, lots of ups and downs in that time. I learned startups can be like that. And but I was getting to work on something really cool. It was it was in behavioral healthcare. They're trying to connect, better connect doctors and therapists. So mental, um, like behavioral health and medical or physical health. And the the premise was good. Um, and like, there were so many people involved, so many touch points. I got to really learn about uh, something called service design. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just working on the UI itself, but also getting to collaborate with like a really cross-functional group of people on, on laying out like, all right, what are all of the steps somebody is, is going through from the time that they're like making a doctor's appointment to talking to the doctor, to getting to like actually talking to a therapist. There's many different things that happen in between. So that was super cool. I really, really enjoyed that aspect. And it was a little too wild for me. Several <laughs> leadership changes just in that year. Um, and I was like, maybe, maybe I want a little more stability in my life. Uh, and that's how I ended up at TPT, our Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, and the TPT was this nice balance of, oh, okay, this is like an education company. They make a product that teachers love. I don't know if any of you are connected to the teaching space, but if you know anyone in K-12, they've probably heard of and probably used Teachers Be Teachers in some way. Mostly it's a marketplace. It's kind of like Etsy for teachers. And um, uh, teachers are like sellers. They can sell things like lesson plans or even um, decoration to print out and put up in your, in your classroom and, and increasingly digital stuff. So things that students can do online. So I work primarily on that, on a platform that where, where teachers can create interactive content, assign it to their students, and yeah, get feedback, stuff like that. Mm. And at TPT, oh yeah, it's like that, it's like, okay, we're doing good in the world, but like, we've been around for a long time, since like 2006, there's like a little bit more stability, stuff like that, and it was a, it was a good group. 
um, to join. And there I've been like getting to solve plenty of um, user problems and UI problems, but also as a design lead and now a design manager, even more around the like, okay, how do you actually design a team? How do you design working with people at the practice? So that's my, the tour of my design career. Um, next, I'm going to go into like, all right, so what do I actually do? Like, and I'm focusing mostly on the, the design aspect of this. So this is Stanford has their, what they call their D school or design school, design thinking process. Design thinking is definitely had plenty of moments over the, the last decade or so. Uh, IDEO was really famous for, for pushing this. Um, and it's, and it's for good reason, because this is, this is pretty close to the process that I follow on a, on a pretty regular basis. So at different levels of um, intensity or fidelity. So it's empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. And those arrows telling us to, all right, after we test things, we learn stuff, we have to come back and kind of go through this again. So what does that actually look like for my work? So empathize, this is, this is definitely my favorite part. Um, this is like, I'm starting a new project. I'm going to get to go and do some interviews, maybe get to do actual observation. Um, these two photos are from, I think these are both from Pivotal actually, where I'm getting to watch somebody do their job as like a Home Depot pro person and someone else who's in like a very specific, uh, I think she was like a government, a, a, an adjudicator for hiring people for the TSA, like all yeah. kinds of really random things you get to work on. Um, and just getting to figure out like, all right, what are these people doing? Where are their problems? Like, what, how can we help them? And I get to do that at TPT, but I also do even more like desk research, which is like listening to podcasts, reading blogs, like just like using a lot of products because I'm on the same product all the time. So I get, get to go really deep on it. So there's less like, I don't know, going back to the beginning, like I would, yeah. Uh, so what does that look like? Do you listen to like podcasts for, about teachers or like, yeah, how? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. My favorite is the 10 minute teacher podcast. Cause I can I just, listen I to know. it in the, the whole world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. There's, there's a lot out there for, for educators for sure. And yeah, I just, my iPhone, my iPad, they're just like full of apps that like teachers sometimes use in their classrooms, always trying to find out like what's the latest thing. Okay. Um, and then after you've like collected all this information, then you're in the define stage. So I'm defining typically the user needs and the business goals. So the user needs, both of these are actually examples for, for users, but just at really different levels of fidelity. You know, the one on top is the, okay, this was, mm -hmm. we just saw a bunch of, talked to a bunch of people and trying to get all of our ideas out and just like all on paper, like. Uh, trying to take like, we just had five interviews and kind of simplify them into um, a few key personas. Like what are the patterns that we see here? And where are like their, their key issues and pain points? Um, and then this one down below is something that's more recent. I mean, nowadays we're doing a lot more digitally as you can imagine. So this is in a program called Miro where we're doing a very similar thing. We're just trying to figure out like, okay, who are, who are these people? What are the things that they're, um, what are they using? What are their behaviors? Like, how can we really like understand um, what they're about? And then for business schools, it's typically like something that's more internal. So I'm, that's like internal interviews with, with uh, people above us, right? So like the head of product, even our CEO, or just people who are setting the tone in terms of like, what are our goals for this quarter or for this year? And what are our constraints on this? Uh, the next step is super fun too. So ideation, you know, this is definitely getting into the part where you think about designer stuff, but so lots of sketching. Okay, I just, I've seen all these problems and I have all these ideas, so let's get them on paper. And a lot of times, especially if we're starting something really like new, like a big feature or a big new project, then we're going to get a big group of people together to actually do what we call diverge, converge, or go wide and then decide. So lots of ideas, get it out as much as you can. And then using things like um, voting or uh, 
uh, like just narrowing things down into smaller and smaller groups, figuring out like, okay, where should we actually start here? So facilitating these workshops was not something I thought I would do in my design career, but it's actually something that um, I really enjoy. And it was actually something that I was really lucky to learn a lot about at Pivotal. Um, it's a lot of overlap with like what the product management role does. So often we're actually like running these things together. Mm. Yeah. And after that, it's prioritizing. Okay, well, like, what are we going to start with? You now, what are we going to make a prototype of? And that's where we're sketching things. We're, 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 we're taking things in more detail into wireframes, which might be as simple as a drawing um, or getting into more higher fidelity, more detailed mockups, or even a clickable prototype. I put coded because I, I actually used to do more of that. I would like make a coded prototype, but these days I, I don't have time for that. <laughs> um, I think it was more just like excited that I could make a prototype at some point. Sure. I, I think there's fewer designers actually doing that now. Plus, clickable prototypes do so much with the like the, the tools like Figma that I used to. Totally, the the tools are really yeah. Because I feel like I, I yeah. Um, yeah, we have like, a question here from Stephanie who's asking, would this be a part of the Agile or Scrum process? And I'm curious if um, like, if when? you usually do Agile and Scrum or... We do follow Agile development at TPT and in all the companies that I've worked in. Though I will say Agile can look really different at any company. This particular part of the process though, is uh, I would say agnostic of that. This is the like, Okay, we're in the figuring out what are we even going to do? Like you have to like know what you're gonna build before you put it into a, a scrum process. Mm -hmm. right? Cause this is really just like still in the messy early discovery stages of like, maybe it's this. Um, yeah, so like, we're just like, we have ideas. Now I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the delivery side in a bit and try to go into a bit more detail and how I work with developers. Um, because yeah, once you have your prototype, here's the thing we think is going to be so great. You put it in front of users and usually figure out how wrong you were. It's very humbling <laughs> to be a designer <laughs> or to be a. Once, I know, but doesn't so it also wonderful. just make you feel so thankful that you're doing it? Like I just like the idea that yeah, like, what if I did that? What yeah. if I had done that? That would have been such a huge waste of time. Yeah, and money and everything. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it, it feels like it's very empowering to have that knowledge. Yes, it's humbling and then empowering. Yes. Yes, yes, both of those things. <laughs> All right. So, recapping this is we, we go through this, you know, we always think like, oh, then we'll test it and then we'll start building it. But usually you're like, oh, wait, actually, we were like really wrong about something up at the define stage. And so we need to, now we've talked to people, go back and refine that or. Or sometimes it's like, okay, now we know we were exploring something really big. And now we realize it should be actually this much smaller section of it first. That's mm. actually going to be the most important thing for us to do. And so then we'll kind of loop through that again. But each of the things is a bit faster the next time around. You're like, you're not going to do a crazy huge workshop. You're just going to be like, okay, no, no, we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to make these changes to the prototype. Then we'll test it again. Um, so that's when we're at the, okay, now we know what we want to do at least we have like our first version or what we think the first release should be and this isn't talking about agile exactly this is actually the what's called a lean startup loop which is build measure learn um but this is where it's i would say it's it's closer to what we're talking about in terms of like what what are we doing for agile like agile is really the like the build part that's like okay i have this idea here, I think I have notes on this. Yes. All right. I've taken my prototype and I've made it much more detailed. This is a screen from a tool called Figma um, that you've probably heard of if you're interested in product design and you've explored it. It's definitely the tool that I use the most. Um, and it's it's got things both for me for creating prototypes and over here on the right is how my engineers come and can get all the details that they need in order to actually build this. Can I actually ask so, you a question about this? So you actually yeah. do like the high fidelity mock-up or like this, like you do the design. Cause like I, in some roles, I guess if you were more of a user experience person, you wouldn't necessarily do like the fine. Right. It's almost like, it's like, um, I feel like a good example is like, David has this term, David, my husband of like fine finishing on carpentry, you know, and how some people like do like the, like they'll like build the wall, but then somebody else has to come and like, 
you know, paint the wall or whatever is the analogy, yeah. but you're doing both effectively here. I am doing both. And in my career, since I started working my job at Pivotal and on, I've always done, I've always had a position that we, I do the whole parts, the whole process. Um, someone had a question in advance of this call that was, what's the difference between a UX designer and a product designer? And while there's not a clear exact answer to that, I do think this is one of those distinctions. Right. Like but, a UX designer probably wouldn't be expected to do this. Part of right. It. A UX designer, they're usually more, more likely to be in an agency or a really big corporation that has like a centralized design team and they're going to be more like project based. And so they're going to work through this. Like they're like, okay, I have given you like the, the blueprints of like, this is what it should be. Like we've, we, my team has aligned on what we're going to, what we're going to build. And it might actually just be wireframes to of like a, a lower fidelity. And then maybe the implementation team has someone who's like a, a visual designer um, who's going to. Who's going to like those. make it look fancy. Yeah. Fancy. Yeah. <laughs> the colors and the typeface and, you know, yes. Yeah. And, you know, when you're in-house as a product designer, you're not making decisions all the time about like, what font should I use and what color That's should I point. use? We're working from a, a blueprint brand. already of like, yeah. what is our design system? Like, I don't. You know, it's like this is you're not like, oh, what size should this header be? You're like, okay, this is the H2. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Like there's 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 plenty of design decisions to make. Like I'm certainly they can make something look bad, but uh, there's a lot of scaffolding there for me to start with. It's not like every day, what color should this button be? Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. it's still this periwinkle. <laughs> Whether I like it or not. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, okay. So I think uh, just finishing up like what I do in terms of the build stage is creating these mockups and then negotiating trade-offs with engineers. Because a lot of times, even if I've talked to them in advance, I'll be like, oh yeah, we could do it like this. Um, we're going to have a modal pop up and then this will change when they click that. There's a moment where they're like, Ooh, actually now that I'm thinking about it or now that I've like, uh, the, the agile process comes in and we've got, we take things and we break them down as small as we can into what we call stories. Um, usually the product manager handles that going from what is our prototype or mock-up into like, what are we building first? And like, what's the order there? Um, and then they'll say like, okay, give like a estimation of time on each of those things or effort. And that's when they might say like, yeah, actually that's going to take like an extra like three days. And we'll say like, ooh, is that really important? Or mm -hmm. is it more important that we get this done on time or get this out quicker? Like, is there another design solution we could come up with? And I actually really enjoy this part as well. It could, it can be annoying at times or tedious. <laughs> um, but when you get to, that's your really creative problem solving, like live with an engineer on like, okay, we've got this problem. What are like three different ways we could do it? Like, let me go back. Let me like try something else. Um, and engineers often have great ideas. So I love working with, with folks who are engaged, uh, designers who are, or sorry, engineers who are engaged with um, the user experience. Um, and then hopefully we're just finishing that off and I'm doing things like quality checks. So just like using it as a user, like trying to click through, find any any bugs and log them. Um, we got two questions that I would love to ask you. One is um, from Erica and she asked, do you think the path from visual designer to product designer involves UX education as a necessary piece? Like, is that, would that be sort of, if you are a visual designer and you wanna become a product designer, is that the part that you need to educate yourself on, would you say? I would. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, uh, it's if you're already a visual designer in a company that has UX designers or a company that's already building things, then the more you can get into that process or just like weasel your way in or just asking questions or offering to give feedback. I personally am like always so eager for the visual designers to give me advice on things. They're mm -hmm. typically really busy and they're they're all, they're all project based, so they're constantly get they have constant deadlines from like the marketing department. And I'm like, Anna, what are you up to? Can you look at something for me? Because she'll just be like, Oh, what have you thought about like this really awesome idea? Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, and I'm like, Oh, thank you. 
Just um, designer. I just like, I don't know. I've like, kind it's of, like, not what you're doing it. all day. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I um, someone else's eyes. So Stephanie also has a good question here, which I think is related, which is that she's asking, would you say that a product designer is more like a user interface designer versus a user experience designer? And um, I wouldn't call them a user interface designer. No. I mean, I think with some, I think very few, I don't know if this is true. I don't know anyone who calls himself a UI designer. So people who call themselves visual designers who primarily work on UI. Yeah. Um, but they tend to flex into the marketing side as well. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but yeah, like a, a product designer is typically a generalist. Every time that we're interviewing someone, like we have like a pretty broad set of things that we're evaluating them on. Um, but actually I'll do it really quick, skip ahead. Uh, this was a quote from one of my heroes, Christina Woodkey. Like they're a generalist, they're usually not good at everything or they're never good at everything, but they're good at one thing and decent at a couple more and that's enough for most jobs. So yeah, going back to the, if you're a visual designer, you're probably really good at that. And if you can just get decent at the earlier parts of like research and um, uh, research synthesis, wireframing, stuff like that, then you'll, you'll be able to slip in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, it sounds like, you would characterize a product designer as like a little bit of UI and a little, and probably a lot of user experience, right? It's like, I don't know how you would put the ratios, but it's, it's both, I mean, is the answer. It, it also depends on where you work. Okay. You know, I, I remember I interviewed somewhere where at some point during the interview, I was like, I think that they really want me to be a visual designer mostly, or like a UI designer. Like they okay. weren't really interested so much in my process and they were like, but could you show us? They're like, like, we want pretty things. things. And you're okay, like, show us more mockups. And I was like, yeah. oh, <laughs> okay, I'll work on that. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, then I'm going to go into after we've built something for the build, measure, learn leap, or start build, measure, learn loop. We're measuring. So a lot of times that's on my end, it's about getting user feedback. Um, by the way, I don't do this all by myself, I also work with a user researcher. Um, but yeah, this is like a, a doc that is super helpful. We've been referencing it, but if I are over time, like finding anything that's in green is like, oh, these are things that are working really well, feedback we've gotten. And the red is like stuff that's not working so well so that we can get a sense of like, this where- This is so cool. Of... I want to show this to my team. Okay, sorry. I love this. Oh yeah, I highly recommend. It. And actually each of these like glue links, links out to a study or a, or a, um, or a quote from a user somewhere. So cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then we're also measuring, of course, with data and business reviews, analytics tracking, though I'm not going to pretend that I'm the person who does that. I am more like, well, help me understand what this is saying. Okay. And then like, how can I help us figure out like, why might that be happening? Do we need to do research? Do we have theories? Stuff like that. But I think this is a really good point. I mean, I hope that everyone who's listening is taking this away from you. And I think they should be and are because... I feel like it's part of how you present stuff. But like, I do think that, you know, like I think sometimes when you're new to attack, you can start to think that like, if you're going to be this role, you have to be able to do all the things that contribute to the role. And that's just not at all reality. No, 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 no not at all. No, yeah. you Because really it would be an impossible task to be really good at all these things. Yeah, don't, don't be overwhelmed by that. Remember, <laughs> really good at one thing and then decent at a few others. And then everyone has their holes. We hire people who are like, yeah, they're really bad at this thing, but we want to have them on our team anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then, sorry, for the next part, we've measured. And then learn is, I would call that, my part of that is helping to interpret any of those signals that we're getting. Mm -hmm. And that's like, okay, this is just a, I think this chart kind of helps um, explain that. But at a high level, like, we're showing, I'm showing like the green dot is like, this is working well. And then like, here's the things that we should work on more. It's like the simplified version of this chart before. Um, and and then from here deciding like, okay, well, what are, what are the things that we actually need to do to improve the creating and publishing experience, for example, or getting our sellers enough data. Mm. Okay. And is that something that you update like all that, like is? This is like a quarterly thing. Okay, interesting. Like, like we're updating this on a, not after every single study, but like throughout the quarter, adding things or like, oh yeah, someone else like learned something elsewhere. Let's like throw it on the board. 
and then using that to synthesize into like which we do next. I just want to disclose at this point now, I'm just asking her stuff for my own edification. How do you come up with these buckets? Like, is it just, it just comes up sort of out of the research? Yeah, these are like the high, really high level user flow. Like at the start is like, these are like each of the key user types, sellers, teachers, students, what are their goals? And then they have to get aware, they create and publish, and then they want to know how much money they're making. And are they making enough? Are they feeling satisfied? Um, we're like, great, we finally figured out how to get them aware of our product. But now they're like, we, how am I, I don't know, I need more data or like, they're not selling enough of this. So we're like, we should probably increase marketing on the teacher side. Hmm. Okay, well, that's my overall what I'm doing all the time. Oh, I should say this, this thing you're looking at here, I actually did create this on my own, but it was like, something that like me and my product manager like worked together on like what would actually be the focus. Like I'm not the person who's like making all of those decisions all by myself. Um, I know I talked about this, but we'll reiterate it one more time because it's so important. Never, never good at everything, good at one thing, <laughs> decent at a couple more, and that's enough for most jobs. Um, and uh, this also to kind of speak to that point is like the getting into like the, I, I work with a lot of people. Like I work in a, it's, we call them pods. So it's a very cross-functional pod that we, a, a day in, day out. I'm oh, sorry, this is like when I'm a designer, not as a manager, <laughs> but um, there's a PM, there is a tech lead who's an engineer, and then there's multiple engineers working with us. And we're very tight. We meet every day. Like you said, we're following an agile process, which means we have like a, we call it two week sprint. So it has like very clear beginning and end. Um, at the end of each two week sprint, we have a retrospective. We look back, what went well, what didn't, did we deliver everything on time? Why not? Um, and what can we do better next time? And then I have this like whole amazing group of people who are specialists in um, research, marketing, data analysis, and customer support that are just like helping us get like information. And also I have my design team. So we're each designer is on a different pod, but we get together multiple times a week to just like share designs, talk through stuff. Um, yeah, how can we make our practice better? Stuff like that. Uh, I have quick books for getting started. I don't think anyone actually asked for this. <laughs> but um, I think this, uh, is kind of thing. this is a good one to start with no matter what, even if you're just vaguely interested in design. I, I think it's it's just a, it's a fascinating book and it'll make you look at the design of everyday things in the UX of your life a little bit differently. Then Laura Klein's UX for Lean Startups is like the much more in-depth version of the talk I just gave or what I just walked through. I think she's, this was like my Bible for when I worked at Pivotal and I was trying to figure out like how to do this job. Lots of specifics in there too. And she's also very funny. Um, Erica Hall is has a just enough research book, which is when you're like really, there, there, it overlaps with lean or UX for lean startups, um, but it's more focused on research because you really do want to figure out like what are the right questions to answer. I also recommend following her on LinkedIn just because she's a very um, interesting human. I feel like she's always got she's like a good mix of angry about the world with like actual ideas for fixing it. Okay, cool. I'm like gonna follow her right now. I'll give the link to everybody. Yeah, do it. Yeah, she has a hilarious Halloween themed talk on design. It's an hour, but it was so good. She does it like in a devil mask and uh, oh, that's really a little bit drunk. It's, but it's a, it's a great primer on like why doing research is important. Mm -hmm. And then sprint is the like, if you want to do the, um, that, uh, the design process really fast, it's uh, actually got to work with John Zaratsky, who was a subwriter of this when I was at, what's it called, Quartet and do a sprint. And mm. say that, actually, yeah, there's a lot that I still go back and reference from this in terms of when I want to really figure out how to solve a design problem with a big group of people. Mm. All right, I think this is my last one. This is probably, if you want to be a designer or get a job in design, this is the blog post that I recommend to everyone. I reread it myself every time that I'm working on mine. Your portfolio probably sucks. Um, and this is about how important it is to make your port, like think about the user experience of your portfolio. Think about your hiring, the hiring manager you're sending it to. Lots of good details in there. 
please read it before you send your portfolio up to anyone. Okay. okay, well, there is some really good questions that I want in the chat that I want to have you address. And I think it relates to the portfolio thing you're just talking about. And that was that this question of sort of what do you do when you look at a job description and it just seems like an unreasonable amount of things that they expect of the person. I can't figure out how to stop screen sharing. So, um, but. <laughs> Or at the very least, unfocus that screen so that it will. I don't know. Yeah. I just go to this. There we go. I did it. I did it. <laughs> it's this one again. Yeah, when it's unrealistic. Um, I think that Christina's post speaks to this as well. So this is a quote from her. Yeah. And it's probably from the article. It's probably why I have it saved. Uh, but like, we we know this. Like, we know that people just like they write the laundry list of things that would be great. It's really hard to write job descriptions. I know this from experience that are really specific because you're kind of like, well, it'd be okay if if they could be this kind of shape or that kind of shape. Um, so I, I think about like, are you really good at one of the things that they've asked for? Then go ahead and apply. Mm. I like that idea. Yeah. Not even, yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, all right, let's look at some other of the questions that are in the chat. Um, what transferable skills can be applied to product design? I'm curious, like, um, I mean, yeah, can you think about that for yourself? And I'm also curious, like, if you see that with anyone that you work with or anything like that. I mean, at, to me, like, I feel like it's funny to me. Sorry, I don't know why I'm having this reaction at this moment. But, like, at this moment, I have this reaction to be, like, the premise of transferable skills is almost suggests that like what you're doing as a user experience designer isn't just talking to people. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like obviously you have a process and design and like a methodology that you've learned, but ultimately like the core of what you're doing is like empathizing, right? So it's like I can see how having been a bartender, but it's also like being a human, great for UX design, you know? Like yeah, I mean I found that um there were a lot of things, even though I, a lot of things from like my graphic design career, where I was, I was doing some of that stuff because I, in, in that I was talking to my client, like a good graphic designer is going to say like, okay, well, tell me more about your customers. And they're going to be trying to find out this kind of stuff. Um, for, yeah, just, but a lot of people are come, come to UX from, and pr product design from things like psychology, you know, or their, uh, so that's the like, oh yeah, just trying to understand people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think another really important skill is, is, it's one thing to empathize, that is really important, but you can just have too much empathy and you're like, okay, well, like I know everything, but like, what do you actually do with that? Mm -hmm. Is like the part that makes or breaks your product that makes it successful by being able to pull out and synthesize like of all of the problems that you have, like what's how could we solve the most important one or like which one of these problems that that's not the most important can we uniquely solve mm -hmm. so that kind of like i don't know that interest in this like analytical thinking and problem solving which you know maybe you're doing as a as a good friend as a as a as a, as a therapist as a bartender <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah how do you feel like you've developed like is that something you learned in your camp? Is that something you learned on the job? Like, much, much more on the job. Um, and I think that that's that's a lot from the collaborating with product managers who are more responsible for like the ultimate like decision making on like what we'll do. Designers do more of the go wide, and then hopefully they're helping to decide like what path to move forward with. But a PM is usually someone who's like able to help the group say like, okay, well, like here are the things we're trying to do. Here are our principles, which is what we're actually going for. Yeah. I worked with some great PMs. I, I, I like really had a keen sense for business and. Uh, that helped. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's another example though. If again, like you don't have to do it all. Right? Yeah. I wasn't hired to be able to do that. Yeah. But like it's just, I was hired for my design skills, but like yeah. it's what makes me a good designer and why people say like, oh, we want to keep working with her or mm -hmm. promote her, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, 
Um, I think you've touched on this, but I think it's worth maybe putting a finer point on it. So, or I guess my understanding of how you've you've at least described product designer versus visual designer in the context of TPT is that like product designers, I'm like, works on the product and visual designer works on probably like marketing stuff, right? And, but they probably also do some brand guidelines and style guidelines. Yeah, like when we, we were, TPT is actually like about to release a big rebrand in November. And so that was like super close collaboration with the visual design team, the brand designers. Yeah, their role is brand design at TPT but I've also seen it called visual. Oh, okay. Brand design. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like I, titles and designer, I mean, titles and development are also confusing, but titles and de design can be just, there's just a lot of I variety, know. I guess. You can be a UX architect apparently, which I always find really silly. I'm just like, what does that mean? Why, why do we have to put architecture into this? <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, it's no, funny I you say that because I was recently in a meeting where someone was talking about like the architecture of the site, and I was like, I was like, what do you mean the architecture? And people just love to throw architecture in to make them like their own job sound more important. Like, it's yeah, not I have a lot yeah. of respect for architects. <laughs> um, I'm like, let me look at I think because I'm just looking at these questions and they're all really good questions, but I think we answered most of them already. Um, let me take a look at those questions, I guess. Is there anything else? Like, I don't know. I mean, how about this? Like, you've got an audience of people right now. They're thinking about transitioning into a career in tech. Any sort of, like, lessons learned, you know, encouragement? Yeah. Are you happy yeah. with your decision to move in? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I was really scared before I started, like, before I made a move. And I was like, oh, I like, my expertise is all in print. Uh, if you start reading things on the internet, you can easily get an overwhelming list of all the things you're supposed to know or be good yeah. at. Um, be careful with that. You know, it's like, I think it's really fun to like explore a lot. There are so many different things to do. So many different things to be a expert in within design, but certain, certainly even more within tech. Uh, so I say like, have your sponge moment, but then like, yeah, pick something or try to go ahead and start small. like and for me i will say like doing the immersive really gave me like a good foundation i was like i had a group of people to support me like doing this all by yourself is really hard mm -hmm. uh, because there there will be lots of letdowns you know especially if you're like okay i did a there's lots of like little courses out there you could take like a video course to be a ux designer or something and then yeah it's probably really hard to get a job right after that because um, I told you my first job in tech was through somebody that I knew, like, even though it was like through this, like unexpected connection, not somebody that I met at a like networking meetup or something. Um, so what did I say? Don't get overwhelmed, have a group of people to support you. Um, I think I do really think that like a, a solid foundation to help you narrow down like what to focus on, like having a curriculum is really helpful. And I don't know. I think those are my main things. We need more women and people of color in tech and people of all ages. Yeah, agree. Well, Linda. It's been a pleasure. Linda is um, gonna have a baby soon. We're really <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> you can't see. <laughs> you can't see. I, um, and I would stand up, except standing up is so painful at this point. Don't do it. <laughs> um, we have a last question here under the wire. Stephanie's asking, did your boot camp offer career help? So, like, if you um, hadn't stumbled upon that, did you have that opportunity? Yeah, they had a. Um, it was General Assembly has a pretty good career support um, network. And I mean, I did it like about 10 years ago at this point. So I think it's probably even more robust, but they had like someone who was a recruiter came and talked to us, which was really helpful getting his perspective on like how he evaluates candidates, how to stand out, stuff like that. Uh, and then I mean, like I got, I hired somebody from my cohort eventually. So. 
there's that. There's yeah, that, that whole, yeah, that connection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love the bartending story because it's like, you know, yeah, I think oftentimes I find that students can be shy about sharing stuff, but you would be shocked if you start telling people what kinds of yeah. crazy things happen. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And actually, that reminds me, I have one other thing that's, that's related to both career and how to get started, but like doing anything you can do to do a real project mm -hmm. is, is great for both like really learning the skills. Like if you're just doing modules on design in general, then it's, it's too abstract. Um, or if you're just looking at these like quick pretend examples. It's like, oh, it made, makes total sense. But once you have to start doing that for yourself, um, is, is, a, is a whole different understanding of it. Yeah. Uh, I had a, actually at some point I was doing like a fun project where I was like, I don't really think I'll make this a business, but I wanted to go through the process of like how would I actually design a business from scratch. And that was super helpful for me. It like helped me to like really, like, I was excited about it. I did a little bit of like, it was like a coaching business. This was, this is how I turned our friend Jenny into a master tailor to the stars just by being a helpful coach to her. I actually I'll don't know this one. story, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess like what you're saying here, because I mean, what we say is like, yeah, it doesn't need to be paid. It can be volunteer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like your family can be your client. All oh, that's all totally material. You know what I mean? Like, because what yes. Linda's talking about is not about making money or doing like, it's about the opportunity to like work with other people and deal, you know what I mean? And like real hu other human beings and sort of deal with the reality and humbling experience that that is. But your example is actually even like more in anyone's control, which is that like, it was actually a project for your, like for yourself, right? Where you were the business owner, but then you had to deal with clients. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, I, I had some ideas about how we could turn it into a product, but I, mm -hmm. then I actually like tried to like do aspects of it, like do a, like a, an MVP like non-technical version of like what would a, like a coaching platform be um, and be the coach. So that was really cool. It, it made me even more interested in like the business side and I think maybe a better designer. And then, yeah, if you can actually find volunteer projects where you get to work with an engineer who's going to build something, even if it's a really basic website, mm -hmm. the more things that you're actually like building, getting out into the world, the better. Because that's where you have to deal with like real trade-offs of like, okay, how do we actually... Get, make this happen um yeah and like oh totally none of it's working and yeah 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 this is this is really good advice um so anyways I, we're at the hour so i'm going to um release you um but thank you so much for coming um where can everyone find you follow along if they want to reach out i don't know if you're open to that i'm on, <laughs> I'm on linkedin i think my it's linkedin slash in and that le joy that's me Awesome. So you guys can all check her out on LinkedIn um, and check out Teachers Pay Teacher. And I think I mean, you have a portfolio. That's cool. I thought it was beautiful. Um, I have a portfolio website, but it does. I don't think it has like real projects on it anymore. I think I had that, that to be, yeah. yeah. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, yeah. And Linda, thank you as always. Oh, oh, you keep disappearing and then coming back. It's very strange. Anyways. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It was lovely to meet you all and answer some of your questions. Awesome. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.